Dr. Coleman for doing Species Spotlight on a pretty cool species. So. Okay, well here we are in the fish room here at Sac State, and the species we're going to look at today is called Stomatepia pindu. Now this is probably one you haven't heard about because it's um, a very rare fish, also a very fascinating fish. I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. So the first thing you'll notice is that they either have no color, you want to look at them that way, or they're a beautiful black. <laughs> they don't have reds or blues, they're, they're just really black. And it can be hard to get good photos of this fish in books because they almost absorb all the light. There's just very little to them other than their blackness. But that's also what makes them very appealing. Now, why you may not have heard of them is because they come from a very special place in West Africa, uh, uh, in the area of Cameroons. They are, um, they are what we call a crater lake fish. So they come from a particular crater lake called Barambium Bow, which is a, a hard name to spell, B-A-R-O-M-B-I-M-B-O, Barambium Bow. And what that is, is that's a former volcano that is not currently active, that has filled in with water. And there is a suite of about nine different species found just in this crater. And by definition, that's going to make them very rare because they are entirely dependent on that one spot to live. So wait, nowhere else in the world? As far as we know, nowhere else in the world. Wow. They have relatives they... elsewhere, but they are only found there. Uh -huh. So you can see how that's going to create a very difficult situation for the conservation of this fish. They're, they're hanging in there now, uh -huh. but of course they're very vulnerable. Now, that would be interesting enough, but they're just fascinating from a number of other reasons. If you look at the tank, you'll notice that there's a whole bunch of them over here, and then there's one individual over there, kind of off on its own. And that one is a girl. And if you get a chance to spot the lower jaw, as she mixes in now, uh -huh. you see that her lower jaw is actually hanging down a little bit. And that's because she's mouth brooding. These are female mouth brooders. And so what she's doing is she has um, eggs in her mouth. She's traveling along the back and she keeps them in the mouth. They're fertilized, uh, she, they're fertilized usually outside. They pick them up very quickly and she keeps them in their mouth as eggs. And then they hatch in there. And they'll spend a total of maybe about two and a half to three, to three weeks that they'll be inside her mouth. And when they come out, they're very large. They're little tiny fish. Now a fish about that size, she can have, she's gone over there. Yeah, is that um, Her, she might have maybe 14 or 15 of them in there. We find this fish very fascinating. We've had this, this particular population for over 10 years now, I had their parents. And, 10 years? And their parents' parents, actually. For wow. multiple generations. And what um, what is fascinating of them, besides the fact that they're rare, come from this cool spot, and they're these, these mouth brooders, is that um, they don't take very good care of the kids. We have noticed over the years, as of other people, that with this fish, if you even put a net in the water, she's very, very quick to let those kids go and to swim away as fast as she can and leave the kids up to the whims of nature. She just kind of throws them she to the dogs. Them like, like, good luck. Um, <laughs> that is so different than some of the other mouth brooders, particularly the ones in East Africa or some of the tilapias. Uh -huh. uh, some of the tilapias, you pretty much have to uh, literally pry the babies from the mum's mouth. I mean, she really doesn't want to give them up. Yeah. But this species, they give them up very readily. Uh -huh. And that probably doesn't make it easy for them from a conservation perspective as mm -hmm. well. Uh, they don't have a huge number of kids, but they do come out very large. Mm -hmm. And so the nice thing about that is they're ready to eat flake food, even as little tiny babies. Mm -hmm. That tells, leads to another thing is, you know, if you want to keep these fish, they're actually relatively easy to keep. Uh, we feed them uh, a typical flake food. We use the tetracyclid, and they do quite well in that. They they survive and they breed. Um, they are sensitive, as are most fish, to the water conditions. Mm -hmm. they, they don't seem to care much about the pH or those sorts of things. 
but they do care if you don't do water changes. Mm -hmm. So you've got to do your water changes with this or things can go downhill pretty quickly. So if you do that, um, they get along quite well. You'll notice we've got different sizes in here from uh, larger ones, and these are even not particularly large adults. They can get almost twice that, twice that size. And we've put in uh, ones which are their kids. Um, we don't see any aggression. The little babies in here, they will not survive because the other parents, the other adults will eat them. So we take those out, grow them up to about the size of these young ones, and then we can put them back in the tank. And they do quite well. Mm -hmm. Now there are actually three species that are all very similar. There's this one, uh, the Pindu. Uh, so this is Pindu again. This is the Pindu. And then there are two other species, um, of which I can't think of the name of right now, uh, which you will sometimes see. One is extremely rare. Um, they're perhaps not as, uh, as attractive, the kind of a more of a gray rather than this pure black, but you'll see those around as well. And they all behave basically the same way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I keep trying to get their black, but it's so inky black. It's... It really soaks up all the light. Yeah. And one thing that's interesting to me is their faces. Like they have these really long... They do have a very long face. face. <laughs> yes, and uh, um, you'll notice this one here, she had a tail damage when she was quite young uh -huh. but she's actually the mother of most of the young ones in here so oh, wow. just because a fish has a few superficial <laughs> issues that doesn't mean that they can't be perfectly good tank inhabitants and excellent moms and so she's uh -huh. she has had many many children she didn't throw her kids to the no she didn't <laughs> <to the park. laughs> so. So, is there any particular reason perhaps why they have these long faces like do the other fish you know, in the crater have them too? Interestingly, we don't know that much about uh, these fish, uh -huh. where they eat in the wild. There have been very few studies on them. Uh, some of them are kind of generalists. We suspect this is more of a generalist, uh -huh. probably eats little fish and invertebrates and things like that. There are other fish uh, in that crater, if not in that one, in nearby ones that are very, very specialized. Uh, we actually have one in another tank over here. This is one that eats only sponges, only oh, freshwater like sponges. Really Let's take a quick look at that one, okay? <laughs> so that's over here. And so this one here, this is called, they have funny names. This is called Pungu McLaren Eye. Okay, hold on. And there we go. Pungu McLaren Eye is a specialist on sponges. Now, fortunately for us, um, they don't have to eat sponges. In the wild, they much prefer them, but here, um, here's, a, here's a larger one. These are, we just got these in the other day, so they're, they're still getting acclimated. Uh -huh. um, they also have a somewhat longer face, not really long. Um, you wouldn't really tell easily that they're very specialized, but there's a lot of interesting stories going on in these crater lakes, and we, we just don't know that much about them. Huh. Very cool. Freshwater sponges, huh? Well, thank you so much for your time, Dr. Coleman. You're very welcome. Stay tuned for more species spotlights. <laughs>